Good day, my name is Audrey Resnick. I'm a senior principal software engineer at Red Hat, working with the Red Hat OpenShift data science team. And today I'd like to talk to you about accelerating ML ops with Kubernetes, CI, CD, and GitOps. So the items that we're going to be looking over include a case study where we're going to deliver an intelligent retail coupon application. We'll be looking at AI ML models and the work of data scientists, specifically in the arena of ML ops. We'll be productionizing a ML model with OpenShift, and then we'll take a deep dive into GitOps and pipelines, and then we'll conclude with our demo of the Globix AR Coupons Intelligent Application. So let's go ahead and take a look at an overview for our retail coupon application. So what's the discount? What we want to do is give the customer the ability to find merchandise discounts for shirts as they browse uh, clothing in a department store. And this was actually a proof of concept project that our leadership team gave myself and two other of my colleagues and they said, you know, can you take our existing resources and build an intelligent application using kind of basic ML ops in under, under two weeks? Well, what we were able to do is with some of the open source technologies that we have and reusing an existing model, we were able to develop a proof of concept in just a few days with the three team members. I'm going to make the caveat there that it is a proof of concept Typically, if you're going to create an intelligent application uh, and vet it thoroughly and go ahead and make sure that uh, it is well situated in production with retraining and modeling, uh, monitoring, that takes a few months. So I just want to put that out there. Uh, with this application, as we mentioned, we're just going to have the user have the ability to walk into a department store pick up a t-shirt or have someone try on a t-shirt, uh, take a picture with your Edge device, which will be your phone, and have that image sent to our model, and then our model was able to see if that particular uh, shirt would have a discount. Let's talk about people in collaboration. When we are going to create an intelligent application, we have a lot of people that we have to work with. Uh, it goes from business leadership that basically goes ahead and gives you a set of goals and metrics, uh, the data engineer that is gathering your data, the data scientist that is going ahead and taking that data and developing a model, and that model being handed over to an application developer uh, so that they could wrap it within a Flask app for deployment and then to the ML engineer and IT operations that are going to help you with model monitoring and um, model management. So besides the people in the collaboration, you also have to pick some tools. And in our case, we decided on a number of data science and ML ops applications and managed services for our tools. They uh, go from Tekton, which is a framework to create CI-CD pipelines, to Kafka, which is uh, a streaming service where we could go ahead and ingest our data, uh, Red Hat OpenShift Data Science, which is a platform that we use uh, for data scientists, developers, uh, and ML ops folks to go ahead to develop, train, deploy a model to Quay, which is going to analyze and distribute some of our container images, Argo, um, which is a GitOps continuous delivery tool for Kubernetes, and S2I, which is source to image. It's basically a workflow that you can use to deliver images um, via containerization within OpenShift. So let's talk about an AI ML model and the work of a data scientist. Now that we know what the personas are, let's see how these personas interact within the steps of the model lifecycle. When we talk about steps of the model lifecycle, we're talking about setting goals, gathering and preparing data, developing a model, deploying the model in an application, and model monitoring and management. 
Business leadership is going to go ahead and set the goals and define the metrics for your project. At that point afterwards, the data engineer will step in. They're going to gather and prepare the data, whether the data is in a data storage or lake. They're going to do some data exploration, data preparation. They may even use something like Apache, Apache Kafka for um, doing some stream processing of the data. Once they have a data set that they feel is ready, they're going to hand that off to the data scientist. The data scientist is going to sit down and they're going to develop, train, test a model. And they'll more than likely do this in an IDE such as PyCharms, uh, where they may initially use machine learning notebooks, machine learning libraries such as uh, TensorFlow or, or PyTorch. And once they feel that they have a model that is good enough to uh, answer some of the, the questions that leadership has set forth in the goals, they're going to go ahead and hand that model off to an app developer. And the app developer is going to deploy the model within an application. This is going to bring into the model lifecycle the parts with uh, CICD and ML Ops. We'll go into that a little further. And then what they're going to do is they're going to go ahead and once that model is deployed, they are going to do some model monitoring and management. Um, this could be for various alerts if the model starts to drift, um, model visualization. And at this point in time, this is where the data scientists can step in and decide, hmm, the model is not really working the way that I expected. And then that's where the model can actually be retrained or they can very well decide that the model doesn't fit the situation and they may go and recreate a different model. You'll notice at the very bottom, IT operations is involved in all the steps. They're the ones that are supporting the entire platform where all these people are working on. So they have a vested interest in making sure that the open source technology that is being used is very safe for the environment, is not going to allow any malware, anything of that sort to compromise the integrity of the, the network uh, that they are currently uh, presiding over. So with that, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And we're going to look at how we develop a machine learning model. I'm going to give you a demo on this, but I wanted to kind of put into context the kind of steps that you may see in an ML operations diagram. And that kind of starts with the data store. You're going to have some location where your data is located. That is going to be taken in uh, for model training. You're going to have your machine learning model. And once you're happy with that machine learning model, you may go and choose to put that model in a model store. That one saves your model, so it's reusable, but it also gives your fellow coworkers the ability to reuse that model if they want to use that model for something else that they're working on. Typically, you're going to create an image of that model, meaning that you're going to wrap that up so that it can be successfully tested and deployed. Uh, and in this case, once we create that image, we usually use containerization for that. We're going to put that image in what we call a registry. And that makes it even easier for people to go ahead and connect to that model and use it uh, for their own uh, data exploration or solving their own problems. Let's go ahead with the demo. Okay, so what, what I'd like to do is actually create a machine learning model that I can use for my intelligent application for my uh, retail coupon application, where I can go to find this platform, which is called Red Hat OpenShift Data Science, is clicking on the launcher icon within the Red Hat OpenShift dedicated cluster. So I'm going to click on Red Hat OpenShift Data Science, and I'm going to log in. And that is going to provide me a platform where I can pick a number of tools that I want to work with. I just clicked on the Explore tab so that I can go through these managed services and applications that are from our various inde independent um, vendors and determine which ones that I want to use to create my intelligent coupon application. I went and I selected Jupyter Hub. That's going to show up in, in the Enable tab. And just to uh, note that within the resources tab, we have uh, access to all the available resources 
uh, such as documentation, tutorials, and quick starts for a number of the different application services and managed services that we have available. I'm going to go back to the enabled icon, or sorry, enabled tab, and I'm going to launch Jupyter Hub. And I'm going to log in. And what Jupyter Hub will allow me to do is to create a specific image that I want to use to build a TensorFlow model. Now, if I didn't want to build a TensorFlow model, I could choose some of these other notebook images if I was doing something within, say, standard data science or minimal PyTorch or PyTorch itself. I could choose those images. I'm planning to use a TensorFlow model that will have these packages included. If there is a package that's missing, what I can always do is do a pip install into the Jupyter Lab environment where this notebook server is going to um, spin it up from. The deployment size that I'm going to choose will be a small. We only go up to small in this public uh, sandbox or domain. And typically, though, the container sizes will go up to extra large. And they give the data scientists the ability to pick how much CPU and how much memory they need for their project. We also have the ability to add environment variables. Environment variables are for those things that you may not want to store directly in your notebook, maybe such as AWS access keys or passwords. And with that, I'm going to start my server. And my server is going to take the choices um, of environment variables, deployment size, and notebook image, and spin up a Jupyter Lab environment that in this case will have all the available TensorFlow packages and libraries that I would need to create a TensorFlow model. Now, remember this Jupyter Lab environment that I'm spinning up is an ephemeral one. When I log out at the end of the day, it'll go away. So all the resources um, will then be freed up for anybody else to use within this environment. And you'll notice that within this environment, when I come in, I've already have a number of projects that I'm working on. And that's important when you're working with others on a project is you really want to be able not only to have your own environment, but to share some of the code that they've developed. And that is done through using uh, GitHub. In this instance, we can initialize a repository that we're creating, first of all, for a project. What I've done just before this demo is I went and cloned a repository. Um, so I put in the name of my um, ARC model for my uh, retail coupon application and basically downloaded the code or sorry, cloned the code into this ephemeral environment. Within this uh, environment here, I have a number of notebooks that I have been working on. The first thing I'll do when I'm trying to create a model is to go ahead and explore the data. So I can connect to S3. I can take a look at an image that I'm using because remember with this coupon application, we'll be using our edge device, which is our phone to take an image that we will feed the model. And in this case, I'm uh, creating a tensor. I will load in a model that I've created. And essentially what I'm doing is trying to make sure that my model at the end of the day does recognize certain objects within the photograph that I've given them. And this is good, it has recognized the objects, but what I want to do is fine tune the model so that what it will do is recognize just the piece of clothing. Uh, that I would take. And it has recognized the piece of clothing. I don't want to go ahead and deploy a Jupyter notebook into production. So what I'll end up doing is taking my prediction model and some of the fine tuning and put it in a prediction.py file. This prediction.py file and some of this other code will then be uploaded to my get repository that when I finish, so that when I return into the OpenShift environment, I can go ahead further into ML ops and actually use some get ops to create an image that I can then deploy along with an intelligent application that will allow us to take pictures and then have the model predict on them. Okay, so now that we've seen how we can go ahead and create a model using the Red Hat OpenShift Data Science platform, 
we need to kind of step back and start considering ML ops. And that question being is, how do we now automate this process of delivering a machine learning model to production? We've gone ahead and we've seen how we've scoped out apps and metrics. We've gone ahead and done feature engineering. We've collected any of our data. We've gone ahead and uh, monitored and validated our model. We've seen um, the model training and, and tuning. So the next step is, is now, how do we automate all of that? I mean, there are a number of moving parts. Well, there are ways to automate this, and we're going to go further into ML ops. To automate this process, let's take a look at how we can productionize ML models using OpenShift. This is going to start with a discussion of OpenShift pipelines. Now, OpenShift pipelines are a cloud-native CI-CD solution that are based on Kubernetes resources. And they use Tekton blocks to automate deployments across the multiple platforms by abstracting away the underlying implementation details. Now, Tekton itself, it introduces a number of standard custom resource definitions that are called CRDs for defining the CI CD pipelines that are portable across the Kubernetes distributions. So of course this means that these are going to be built for Kubernetes, they're going to scale on demand, you're going to have a secure pipeline execution, and this is going to be very flexible and powerful. With that in mind, let's now move on and we're going to take a look at data and ML pipelines. In our data pipeline, we're going to have data coming in from a number of resources. And when we take the data from the number of resources, which could be clusters or environments, we want to be able to gather or collect that data in a central location where we can then do feature extraction for our models and then put the data within a data store so that it's readily accessible by our data engineers and our data scientists. Okay, so here we are for our other demo. What we're going to do with this demo is actually create a Kafka instance. Remember, we need some way to be able to handle the data that's streaming in, mainly our images streaming in, and to be able to push that to our application, which we created before, or application and model, which we created um, in OpenShift uh, beforehand. So let me share my screen with you. And I'm going to admit that I had to go uh, ahead and do a little bit of cheating before. We uh, went ahead and delivered our containerized uh, model. What I did is I broke out the uh, front end application and deployed um, an object um, detection application made from Node.js. And when I do that, I'm able to go ahead and connect that to our model that we created. So now that we have our model and we have this front end and we have that model working uh, where it would uh, pull in some of the pictures, let's get this working with streaming data. The way that we're going to do that is again through uh, creating a Kafka instance. Now a Kafka instance in OpenShift Streams for Apache Kafka We'll include the Kafka cluster or bootstrap and the configurations that are needed to connect to the producer and consumer services. Now, we're going to be creating this Kafka instance and related resources in a similar way as that we did in creating our OpenShift uh, containerized image. So we'll go ahead and click on Create Kafka Instance. I've already created one previously, so I'll just reuse that name. And it's be going to be called uh, a Resnick Object Detection. The cloud provider is going to be Amazon Web Services. Uh, I have one region to choose from. And the availability zones are going to be multi by default for our test um, cluster here. So that's going to take a while to actually create that image. The next step in that is to actually go ahead and create what's called a service account. 
And that's the way that we're going to connect these applications to our Kafka instance uh, in order to be able to feed data to it. Now, unfortunately, even if this went ahead and created, I found out, and I'm sure none of you have read into this before, that all the licenses for this particular test cluster have been taken out. So what we're going to do is actually step through the remaining items, but we'll be doing it from a workbook that I have. So I'm gonna just bring that workbook into view. Now remember, I went ahead and I created that image. Then what I want to do is to go ahead and click on connection. And in the connection, uh, we create that service account to set up the account. So I would click on create service account. I would give it a specific name. So in this case, I put, might put my username a resnick dash Kafka dot dash essay, and I would create it. And what will happen is that I'm going to be granted certain credentials. Um, that's going to be to a secure location. And once I have copied those over into Notepad, I would save them so that I would have access to them later on. After I go ahead and create that service account, I also have to set an appropriate level of access for that account. And that's in the access control list or ACL of the Kafka instance. So I'll go into my uh, account and then I would go into access tab to view the ACL for that. And I would click on manage access and then I would use an account drop down to select the service account that I previously created and connect next. And this is where if you uh, saved these um, credentials from before, you would be looking them up to see that that account actually matches. And I would go ahead and manage uh, the access for this. And in this case, I would review any existing uh, permissions. We wouldn't have any of those. So we would go ahead and um, assign permissions to our topic, consumer group, and transactional ID. I would save those. And then we go ahead and create topics. And that's going to, when we start creating Kafka topics, that's going to start producing and consuming the messages in our service. So at the Kafka instances of the web console, we go ahead and we click the name of our Kafka instance that we created earlier. And we click on create topic. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually use these topics to go ahead and connect to the application services that we've created before within Red Hat OpenShift. And of course that instance has timed out, but that's okay. So we go ahead and create those. And then um, when we go ahead and save everything, we will actually have the ability then to um, use our app where we would be able to take a picture because we have this Kafka service now, that picture would go through the Kafka service. The Kafka service is uh, connected to our application front end that I created with Node.js. So it's gonna go through there. There's a REST API that's going to be called to our model. That photograph or image will go to the model. The model will go ahead and do the detection and then send back the results. Um, through the Kafka streaming service so that we can actually go ahead and look at them later on. So let's go ahead and close this part of the demo. Sorry that we weren't able to give you a really live demo, but again, that's what happens when everybody's scrambling for resources. And we're gonna go back to the presentation and talk a little bit more about ML Ops and OpenShift. Okay, so now we're going to move on from our data pipeline to looking at the machine learning pipeline. So you ask, what is a machine learning pipeline? Well, kind of the definitions that float around include that the machine learning pipeline is just a means of automating the machine learning workflows by enabling your data to be transformed and correlated into a model that can be then analyzed to achieve your outputs or achieve your goals. 
And this type of pipeline makes the process of inputting the data into the machine learning model fully automated. Now, you can create the resources required to run a machine learning pipeline by setting up a data store that we had talked about across um, to access the data that's needed in your pipeline steps. You can configure a data set object to point to persistent data that may live in or isn't accessible in a data store. And you can set up various compute targets on which your pipeline steps will run. Okay, let's talk about the OpenShift GetOps pipeline. Now, the OpenShift GetOps pipeline is going to ensure that you have consistency in applications when you go ahead and deploy them to different clusters in different environments. And that can include environments such as development, staging, and production. And it also goes ahead and organizes the deployment process around the configuration repositories and makes them the central element. And it always has at least two repositories, the application repository and the source code, and the environment configuration repository that defines the desired state of the application. Now, these repositories contain a declarative description of the infrastructure you need in your specified environment, and they also contain an automated process to make your environment match that described state. Specifically, though, the OpenShift GetOps helps you automate the following tasks. You're going to ensure that your clusters have similar states for configuration, monitoring, and storage. You're going to be able to recover or recreate clusters from a known state. And you can apply or revert configuration changes to multiple OpenShift container platform clusters. Uh, also, you have associated templated configuration with different environments. And lastly, you're able to promote applications across clusters from staging to production. Now with that, let's take a look at the release pipeline. Okay, once your intelligent application has been containerized, the next thing that's going to happen is we have to have that release pipeline in place. So what we're going to focus on is anytime there are new changes made into our Get repository, that's going to trigger something within our ML service and our intelligent application. Um, may be changed by some of the new code that we go ahead and add in or just some of the finer tuning and it will go ahead and deploy and then again at that point we can go and look for model drift uh, and if we need to we can always take our model offline and go ahead and retrain it if necessary or if the data or the results that are coming from it are not at totally at all what we want we can go ahead and pull that model completely offline and rebuild it. This final diagram puts everything together that we've talked about. We've started with some data that we ingested. We've uh, been able to get a data scientist to create a model for us, so the model has been trained with that data. The model may be stored within a model store. We can create an image out of that model using the OpenShift platform, and we can test that image and make sure that it has nothing in it that will cause it to crash within our system, or at this point in time, it looks like it is valid for the goal that we have set. So we can register that model image within a model image within a model image registry. And what we will then do is that once we have that model there, we can, from our application, which we've created in GetOps that relates to the model, um, can have a trigger for any new model changes and we can put our machine learning service into play and have our intelligent application ready for use or deployed or synced. And at that point in time, when we have everything online, we just go ahead and monitor our model, make sure that there's no further drift, that the model is performing as expected, and we can continue this loop for as many times as we want to until our machine learning model is operating the way that we expect. This takes us to the intelligent application that my colleagues and I created. Remember, again, this is a proof of concept, and this is an example case for MLOps with OpenShift GetOps and pipelines. 
The demo that we are going to have is, again, for a retail application. And what I want you to do is to take your iPhone and go ahead and point it at the, the uh, QR code. What that is going to do is it will open up uh, a camera automatically, and you can either take a picture of the t-shirt here that is in this diagram, or you can get somebody to stand up in front of you and take a picture of the shirt that they're wearing because at the end of the day, out of the objects that are being displayed here, we want the model only to recognize the clothing and to be able to apply a discount to the clothing. Well, you should have ended up with something very similar like this. After taking a picture of the barcode, you're going to have a camera feature come up. You're going to go ahead and take a picture of the clothing and you'll see that that clothing would be associated with a discount. So this shows that our model has been able to successfully recognize a piece of clothing. In our code that we've used for this application, it applies a discount, but more importantly, the pictures that you are all taking are going through and streaming through our Apache Kafka services or our data pipeline. The information is then being fed into our model through our model pipeline. And then we're given a result, thankfully, via the intelligent front end or app UI that we've stored within a Git repository that, guess what, has been brought in through OpenShift and has been associated with our model. Thank you for your time today. I would like to give you the opportunity to try out the Red Hat OpenShift Data Science platform for free. If you're interested in taking a look at how you can go ahead and develop, train, test, and deploy a model, go to https developers.redhat.com slash products slash Red Hat OpenShift Data Science. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference.